Good evening. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education at the Modern Art Museum at Fort Worth, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to being there, revisiting Tuesday evenings at the Modern, our online alternative to the long-running lecture series Tuesday evenings at the Modern. So tonight, there's no need to silence your phone. This is us coming together and being social in a time of social distancing. While we are disappointed that our remaining spring 2020 um, schedule has been postponed indefinitely, we are using this opportunity to raid our deep and rich Tuesday evenings archive. So join us each Tuesday and our regular, um, regularly scheduled time slot, 7 to 8 p.m., for being there. Tonight, we began with the one and only Lucy Lepard as she presents her April 17, 2012 presentation titled Undermined, complete with the original introduction and Q&A. That said, we have trimmed a little bit off of either end so that we come in under an hour. If you are so inclined, we will have a YouTube live chat afterwards, a casual and cordial exchange. Please hold your questions and comments until the end, though. So with that, let's get started. Let's see how this works. And now back to tonight's Tuesday evening's uh, finale for 2012, spring 2012. Um, to my mind, we could not close what has been um, a remarkable season in a bigger, more profound way than with writer, curator, critic, and activist Lucy Lepard. It has been with great anticipation that many of us have looked forward to this evening. And um, all of her various roles, uh, Lucy Lepard has done nothing less than change the way we see and understand art in the world. We have all come up uh, through her discoveries, insights, and declarations. With a BA from Smith College and an MA from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, Lucy began as an art critic in 1962, receiving a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1968, two NEA grants in criticism, and recognition in 1975 as the CAA, with the CAA from, um, with the Frank Jewett Mather Award for criticism. Her um, 1968 exhibition, Eccentric Ex Abstraction, set the standard for what would be termed post-minimalism or process art. And in the same year, her article with John Chandler for in Art International coined the phrase dematerialization of art, which anticipated conceptual art as addressed in her historic 1973 book, Six Years, the Dematerialization of the Art Object from 1966 to 1972. Um, if it wasn't required reading as you were coming up, I would recommend it now. Um, I believe to date that Lucy is author of 21 books and has curated 50 exhibitions, receiving the Bard Award um, for Curatorial Excellence. Always the advocate for the artist, Lucy was co-founder of Printed Matter, an art bookstore in New York centered on artist books, and, an, um, and as an activist, one of her... Um, Many endeavors was the founding of the Art Workers Coalition. She was also a founding member of the feminist journal Heresies and Heresies Collective, as well as political art documentation distribution, artist call against um, U.S. intervention in Central America, and other artist organizations. She was recognized for these contributions and others with the Women's Caucus for Art Lifetime Achievement Award. The list of Lucy's contributions is impossibly long, as is the recognition that she has so deservedly received. But I have to note that she has been awarded eight honorary doctorates of fine art, which blows me away, and that the Smithsonian, and this is perhaps even a bigger deal, and that the Smithsonian holds evidence of her thoughts and works in their archives of American art. While I understand that Lucy Lepard is charming and that her brilliance is clear when she opens her mouth to speak, this is not a cult of personality. We are all here tonight to witness her presentation undermining because of Lucy Lepard's notable contributions to the discourse of art what she has brought to our attention, and the directions, directions she has set. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Lucy Lepard. So it's hard to live up to these introductions. You wonder, like, who is that person? <laughs> um, do I just poke this and see what happens? 
And do the lights go down? Yeah. yeah. Okay. John, are you with me? <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. I, I have to admit I'd never been to Fort Worth, and I think this is one of the most gorgeous museums I've seen. Let's, okay, then. Now the lights down. And, yeah. My little... The slides are, are, the images are really important. I'm not going to talk much about them, but they are very important. So look at the screen. <laughs> Over a decade ago, I was asked to speak at a symposium about the global city in London. It didn't interest me much because I'm a country girl now. So I thought I'd undermine that invitation and talk about gravel pits, a verbal visual riff on pits and erections, extraction in aid of erection. The antithesis of the city, the classic erection, is its birthplace, the pit. And you're welcome to read in some feminist innuendos there. <laughs> Soon after that talk, September 11th happened, a startling reversal, towers to pits. And that provided the brackets for the book I'm writing now, <clears throat> years later, which is the basis of the talk tonight. This is by Peter Gowen. It's the Nevada test site from his nuclear, nuclear landscapes book. So my book is called Undermining, literally, as in pits and shafts that reflect culture, nourish or alter irreplaceable ecosystems, and generate new structures. More specifically, the gravel pit is a stand-in for the bottom level of the 21st century cultural landscape, what cultural geographer J.B. Jackson called the subterranean economy. And finally, undermining is a political act, as in subversion and subtext, or its extraterrestrial strategies. Undermining is what we're doing to our country and the planet. I'm concerned with mining as land use and as metaphor, but this is also about nuclear testing, archaeology, alternative energy, photography, tourism, land art, adobe building, Native American sacred sites, climate change, and the kitchen sink, literally, because water plays a huge part in anything regarding the New West. I'll only touch on a few of these here, lucky you. <laughs> I've always been obsessed by the collage aesthetic, the way Dada and Surrealism explored the unknown by juxtaposing two unlike images to form a new reality. And of course, collage is also a staple of feminist art. So this book is an experiment in parallel verbal and visual narratives. This collage is fittingly built on gravel, an aggregate often formed by water. Real gravel, naturally created pebbles, is geological debris constructive disintegration, alluvial, waterborne from old streams and lake beds. Some gravel is fake, just crushed rock, produced by dynamite and hard rock mining, socially and ecologically destructive processes. Scarce water can be used to separate it from its mother load. I'm just trying to figure out. Groundwater is polluted in the process. Erosion flourishes. My last book was also about digging. It was an archaeology and history of the Tano Indians, who incidentally farmed with gravel mulch to preserve heat and water. They were in the area that I live in, in New Mexico. This one is as much about the process as about any subject. I'm applying an artist's strategy to so-called creative nonfiction, which I'm not quite sure that what that is, but it gives you a lot of wiggle room. I've always learned most from artists, and personally, my gravel pit obsession offers me a sort of dialectical take on the relationship between my 30-plus years in the New York City avant-garde and 20 years in rural New Mexico. I just realized what slide that was supposed to be there. That's by Ed Ranney, who was the photographer who worked on my last book, and it's a, a ruin of a Pueblo, some of the Pueblo people who lived in the Galisteo Basin, where I live. So the methodology of this book is simple and experiential. One thing leads to another. Almost any framework would have sufficed. The challenge is keeping the warps and wefts on the loom. The interface is crucial. And that's a long introduction, but I wanted to know, let you know what you're in for. I became obsessed with gravel pits when the local earth mover, who's also an artist, reproved me for griping about gravel mines as blights on the landscape. He said, hell, you used gravel for your road. Everybody wants gravel. They just don't want gravel mines. If you're going to go after gravel, go for the multinationals, not the locals. So apparently Lafarge, a global gravel mining corporation, is taking over the American West, putting the locals out of business. This was a surprise. I naively considered gravel pits, when I considered them at all, as the epitome of local enterprise. You have some otherwise unproductive land, you have a couple pickups, you need money, and you go for it. I'm told this is the way it used to be. 
Global takeovers are something else. Scale is a big issue here, visually and economically. I'm told that the aggregate industry, crushed rock, gravel, and sand, is the largest mining industry in the country. In the 1960s and early 70s, I was very enthused, as were so many of us, about earthworks. This is obviously Robert Smithson's spiral jetty, now AKA Landart. The earthworks were escape attempts, ways to get out of or beyond the city and the art world's institutionalized trajectory, from critic to gallery to museum to book to fame. I always loved being outdoors, and here was art coming to meet me. Since then, I've talked about land art in the rearview mirror, because it's been replaced in my windshield by land use or cultural geography. In the 20 years that I've been living in the West, land has become more than a site, more than a landscape. It's a place, a collaboration between people and nature. I still respect much of the older work, but the better I know the new West, the more my attention is claimed by peripheral vision, by the side shows, the side of the road shows, life on the land. I've learned a new vocabulary, or perhaps overwritten the old one. It's a stretch to squeeze modernism, modernity, postmodernity into the framework of my current lived experience, which is what I've always worked from. But of course, that's just what I'm trying to do here. Modern and contemporary art have been primarily metropolitan practices, but out on the margins, where local scars cover for global perpetrators, we live in a kind of mirror where ne negative space here is more important than what's constructed from its deported materials there. I'm riding the roads between local and global, rural and metropolitan, and I'm trying to see what art I can bring with me, what'll fit in my baggage. This is a Pueblo shrine near me. This is, is this blurry? I guess this is where I'm sitting. A little blurry, okay. <laughs> uh, in 1990, two Hopi shrines on Woodruff Butte near Holbrook, Arizona, were deliberately destroyed by a gravel miner providing material for federally funded highways. Given the fact that native peoples inhabited the entire continent for millennia and that oral traditions produce very long memories, it's not surprising that ancient and contemporary sacred sites are ubiquitous in virtually every state of the Union. Nor is it surprising that ignorant white people, which is most of us, dismiss indigenous claims to apparently undistinguished natural features. Their migration paths, their in almost invisible shrines, and places where medicinal plants are gathered or where legendary events took place. Native sacred sites are significantly often embedded in or embodied by nature itself. The fundamental issue here is that we colonials are hard put to understand the sanctity of unimproved pieces of earth. The intricate connections between mountains, springs, and lakes, and Native American religious culture are particularly evident in the Southwest. When white Americans are confronted with anything Indian, they're likely to buy what Guy Debord called the false consciousness of time, relying on that which meets the eyes superficially rather than reading the temporal layers lying before us waiting to be intellectually excavated. For Pueblo peoples, two of the six sacred directions are up and down. A couple of these are my, uh, my own wonderful photography. <laughs> I suddenly realize I don't have something and I rush out to the patio and put a couple of stones on something and take a picture. All over the West, we see collisions of these two incompatible land uses, indigenous sacred sites and resource extraction. For instance, the Zuni Pueblo Salt Lake in western New Mexico is sacred to several tribes. For years, it was threatened by a strip mine that planned to pump billions of gallons of scarce water from the ground, mostly for dust suppression, and to provide more power for Phoenix, Arizona, the epitome of wasteful consumption in a desert landscape. The lake had already become a sacrifice zone. A newspaper article described it as resembling a transplanted segment of crumbling New Jersey industrial shoreline replete with dilapidated buildings, the sagging rusted steel frames of conveyor belts, and the husks of wrecked cars. This was all the wreckage of a commercial salt recovery business that had operated before the Zuni people were able to reclaim the land in 1985. After years of litigation, the coal mine was fended off. A cleanup is underway. On a gravel bar extending into the lake where salt is dried white on the surface of the black gravel, a few prayer sticks have been planted. It's impossible to talk about gravel, salt lakes, and New Jersey in an art context without confronting the monumental presence and absence of Bob Smithson, who brought to North American attention the notion of the Earth's raw materials as art and the entropic appeal of pits. 
His first proposed earthwork in 1966 was called Tar Pool and Gravel Pit. And just before his accidental death in 1973 in Texas, he was trying to get Peabody Coal to fund a reclamation artwork. Several years ago, I was driving with a friend through the Navajo Nation, and we invited ourselves into Peabody Coal's domain on Black Mesa, a fenced-off reservation within the reservation. I wanted to take a couple of pictures of the humongous pits and machinery, this is it, that echo other industrial sites dotting the Navajo Nation and coal plants. Peabody supplies energy primarily to Las Vegas, a desert gambling town that now has a population of one and a half million and counting. I was about to take the picture when I was stopped by a drive-by Peabody security officer who was Navajo, and she said, no photographs. No photographs is a common and historically justified admonition on Indian lands, especially at sacred sites and during the seasonal ceremonial dances. In some of the New Mexico pueblos, you can pay to take pictures, but for the most part, they're discouraged. So I'm down with the idea that unpermitted photographs are unacceptable invasions. This is from Canyon de Chez in Arizona. But Peabody Coal, maybe it's sacred to capitalism. Eventually, the whole beautiful mesa and a lot of the area's very scarce water will disappear into the pockets of the corporation. Black Mesa itself is a major archaeological site and the location of myriad Navajo and Hopi sacred places. Maybe the Navajo security officer had a double agenda. Oops. This is Bob Smithson's Passaic uh, monument uh, out of his Passaic piece called Monument with Pontoons, the Pumping Derrick. Carl Andre, whose horizontal focus helped redefine the sculptural axis in the 60s, once said that all art is agriculture rather than industry. As Wes Jackson of the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas once said about farming, there's more to be discovered than invented. A caveat that might have come from 60s conceptual artists who warned that the world needed no more objects. Pits and ruins epitomize their anti-object stance, focusing on the appeal of absence rather than presence, the invisible rather than the visible, the horizontal rather than the vertical, ideas rather than commodities, and the dematerialized rather than the monumental object, and so forth. Smithson liked to quote Andre saying, a thing is a whole, in a thing it is not. Classic Andre statement. <laughs> and in, his, in Smithson's 1967 tour of the monuments of Passaic, New Jersey, which you see here, he talked about how full of holes the prosaic Passaic seemed in contrast to solid New York City. Earth artists were inspired by and envy the vast pits, anaconda, Kennecott, and other global plants make in the earth as well as the great monumental civilizations of the past whose borrow pits have long since become part of the topography. Michael Heiser's created his own pits, double negative, and directions, the big thing called city something, which is one mile long and 500 feet high in the long-suffering state of Nevada, where his archaeologist father analyzed native petroglyphs in the Great Basin. The city will virtually replace a nearby mountain that's been removed by anaconda, they donated the earth piecemeal to the artist for his monument, which will be visible primarily from 20,000 feet in the sky. This is Nancy Holt's sun tunnels with our dog in it. <laughs> Classic American earth art <clears throat> was a mostly urban art, borrowing the, the emotional power of extraordinary Western landscapes. Land was a raw material for individual expression, and space was a kind of mat within the frame around the photograph. A pseudo-rural art made from a metropolitan headquarters, earthworks take much of their power from distance, distance from people, from issues, and even from places. There were even religious undertones along the lines of the 19th century sublime. Isolated from everyday experience, often in the desert, an iconic spiritual site, most land art is site-specific but not place-specific, superimposed on a place and its inhabitants rather than collaborating with them. Most admirers, however, envision rather than visit the classic earthworks. Our impressions are mediated by the glamorous photographs and aerial views, which are critical not only to earth art's dissemination, but to its impact. The best of the classic land artists offers, offer simultaneously a spectacle and an intimate experience, instruments for seeing as much as objects to be seen, and in that I include sun tunnels of Nancy Holt. Gravel and travel are symbiotic. The horizontal is iconic in the landscape of the American West, the sprawl, the highway, and the railway that lead to growing cities, 
the road that becomes a place in itself, a site of mobility, as J.B. Jackson put it. This is another photograph by Ed Ranney. We're drawn through the landscape on what Chellis Glendinning has called the fingers of imperialism. These gridded lines laid out for us inform a way of seeing that flattens and blurs the places they run through, like photography, which I think is one reason photography's grabbed so many contemporary artists, as it's grabbed me too. In the arid southwest, however, gravel pits can be less than eyesores. The great western panoramas are already gravel pits. Nature made some, humans made others, and some of those humans are artists. Driving by, you often can't tell if the erosion is natural or the human-made creation of erosion and flooding or deforestation and overgrazing, unless, of course, the site is squirming with machines. The gravel mine shown here lies a few miles from where I live in Cerrillos, New Mexico. The western Galisteo Basin has been a mining district since the 10th century or so. First turquoise, then silver, gold, copper, lead, and coal. Gravel is today's gem of choice. In a rural context, gravel pits are nature's ruins, organically evolving monuments to negative space. They're decidedly unspectacular. Nobody goes to see them. We had to sneak into this one to get the picture. <laughs> their emptiness, their nakedness, suggests an alienation of land and culture. As traditional rural industries like ranching and mining subside, bowing to the contradictory needs and greeds of contemporary society, environmentalism, development, Abandoned pits become bird sanctuaries faster than anyone thought possible, partly because so much habitat is being destroyed by urban sprawl that the birds have to settle for whatever they can get. In an ironic twist, a few years ago, bird occupation of a pit slated to become an Ohio landfill derailed the National Clean Water Act. Go birds. <laughs> Whoops, did I miss a slide? Yeah, there's some. In the southwest, you can still see little adobe houses with a pit next to them where the mud for making the adobe bricks was taken out, perhaps a century ago, perhaps yesterday. When abandoned, these houses return gradually and organically to the earth. But in many areas, giant gravel trucks on their way from ubiquitous pits are literally shaking the old mud houses and prehistoric ruins to their foundations, cracking these chunks of cultural history and rending the illusion of quiet village, village life. I live in a village with 250 people, and when those gravel trucks come through, you know it. There's some poetic justice in the fact that the Indian Pueblo of Okeawinge in northern New Mexico is one of the few communities to have successfully resisted the invasion of a monster local gravel operation by adopting a weight limit ordinance on the road that passes through the, the Pueblo. On the other hand, many Pueblos also run resorts with golf courses, the folly of which in the arid west is another hot topic in the cultural landscape. This is by Patrick Nagatani. It's uh, a comment on the uranium mines on the Navajo and Laguna reservations and traditional Pueblo clowns. New Mexico, commercially known as the land of enchantment, is extremely dependent on the tourism industry for survival. It's the straw being grasped by desperate economies, by places often mi ravaged by mining and gas oil development or abandoned by the second home fed. Featured are Indians, archaeological sites, the military, and the, in and the nuclear industries. A few decades ago, several of those elements came together in the uranium mines of the pueblos of Acoma and Laguna and then the Navajo Nation, eventually killing off a lot of those picturesque native people. Even though culture is an acknowledged moneymaker, tourism doesn't fit into the macho image of the past unless it resurrects that, that image as a spectacle. Earth art isn't exempt. Charles Ross's Star Axis and James Terrell's Roden Crater, already under construction for more than a quarter century, plan eventually to have visitor centers and tourist facilities. This is a Star Axis, Charles Ross's piece uh, under construction in northern New Mexico. I have to say that this is a pretty fascinating piece, and it has hacked away a whole chunk of Mesa, but uh, a lot of people will not miss that part of the Mesa. So. Walter de Maria's lightning field already has its own exclusive infrastructure. Land art can simultaneously participate in regional economic development and slyly call attention to the fact that many famous Western landscapes are surviving precisely because of cultural heritage and recreational tourism. This is a scene in the Galisteo Basin. Eudora Welty once wrote that one place understood helps us understand all places better. 
So for years, I've been preaching the importance of the local, taking responsibility for the place where you find yourself, even if you don't come from there or not staying long, and understanding its ecology, the connections between everything existing there, including in human inhabitants. I live in this tiny village with a rich history, and I find great comfort in its identity as a mere point in a broader landscape of gullied rangeland and distant mountains. At the same time, I'm constantly reminded how global my beloved local really is. A mile to the east is the highway down which trucks carry transuranic waste from Los Alamos and elsewhere to the waste-intensive pilot plant in Carlsbad, a pit that receives rather than gives. It's a geological lockbox for the chemical sludge lab gear and filters laced with radioactive plutonium, the fiendishly toxic, somebody called it, detritus of nuclear weapons production. Waste drums of this stuff, and maybe worse, is buried almost a half mile underground in salt beds supposedly secure for 19,000 years. Got that right down. Despite doubts about leakage and dangerous transportation on public roads, as in this photograph by Donald Woodman who caught one of the trucks going along. And then some 200 miles to the southeast is the Trinity site at the White Sands Missile Range where the first atom bomb was detonated just before dawn on July 16, 1945. Even in New York, I lived a few blocks from Canal and Broadway, a site once chosen by experts as the most efficient target in the New York area for a nuclear strike. And Klaus Oldenburg once uh, pro pro uh, proposed a monument for the spot. So nothing is more local than ecology, and nothing is more global than a nuclear world. This is at the White Sands Missile, missile Range, the Trinity site. This, this guy's T-shirt was too much. <laughs> this is by Phil Young, who's Cherokee. Uh, but I think it's Canyon de Chez. So no place seems particularly central today. Deracination is embraced by contemporary postmodern artists. For example, in Irwin's Transnationala project of 1996, a small group of Slovenian and Russian artists RV it across the USA, disregarding the unfamiliar geography while living in their heads. The resulting book transcribes their provocative conversations about international art ideas, which are totally unaffected by the places they travel through. Not even the Grand Canyon is mentioned in the dialogue that took place there. Maybe that vast erosion, that pit to end all pits, was too much, banishing art and mind back to the city, the ultimate modern destination, where culture is unaware of its origins. And uh, you can tell the Phil Young piece is about uh, you know tourists and pictures. The Grand Canyon is also a sacred site to several tribes. In an urban context, the pit represents both destruction and con construction, the rapid movement and change that characterize city life. September 11th speeded up the process, changed the meanings, undermined our social assumptions of invulnerability. I like to think the word gravel is related to the word grave. Living in what was becoming Soho in the 60s, I watched the Twin Towers go up. And in 2001, over the radio in New Mexico, I heard them come down on their way to becoming the most famous pit in the world. Soon it was just a hole in the national psyche that replaced earlier ground zeros, the Trinity site in New Mexico, the craters of the Nevada test site. Fresh Kills Landfill on Staten Island, slated to become an art installation, became a cemetery without markers, another flattened erection. This is by Amy Stein, <laughs> and I thought, I thought, isn't that amazing that she caught this? And then I was told that the coyote was stuffed. And then I was, then I was told that that wasn't true, so who knows? <laughs> In the American West, it's been said, nature is politics and politics is nature. The more the myth of the Old West gives way to the mundane real estate realities of the New West, the clearer it is that the West is no more natural than any other place. And a few, and few general, genuine wildernesses remain, if any. But our national concept of nature has its home in the Wild West, protecting its open spaces and public lands against the human agency that produced them in the first place is tantamount to preserving the American ideal. Alaska is still called the last frontier, while the long gone western frontier in the lower 48 remains part of our psychogeography. As tourists or pilgrims to the great land art sites, our expectations determine to a large extent what we see out there in the great unfamiliar and what we overlook in the sense of a scenic overlook. 
Adventurers from more populous places of the parts of the country and abroad forged their way over bumpy dirt roads to see the great monumental earthworks which have become trophies of a sort on the art tourism checklist. The artists usually wear cowboy boots. They're mostly men, since women are rarely able to raise the millions of dollars it's taken to build the grand, not to say grandiose, earthworks. And this is uh, <laughs> by Nancy Douthy. It's three weeks, six earthworks. These two women went across the West going to all the major earthworks, doing performances in response, uh, sort of feminist performances. <laughs> this, uh, she, there she is at, at Spiral Jetty. Land arts play, this is by Glenn Baxter. <laughs> I love it. I have this pinned up over my desk. Yeah. Land arts place in the New West is ambiguous. With the possible exception of Spiral Jetty and Lightning Field, earthworks aren't yet near the top of the destinations list. Our state tourism thing, which is going strong at the moment, has never mentions them. But they are playing their part as tourism becomes a major industry in a region where the land itself is more compelling than any museum or on the dystopian side, where protected land and beauty strips are museumized in a landscape marred by extraction and greed. In fact, I've come to the reluctant conclusion that land art is for city people. It offers an antidote to the urban landscape often crammed with art and visual competition. Public art belongs in towns, places where people interact with the built environment on a frequent, familiar pedestrian basis, places where public art can literally inform or enhance a neighborhood or public domain. This is the Santa Rita mine in Arizona, which I saw last week. This, this doesn't do it justice. It was a very gray day, and it's just an amazing, it goes on and on for miles and miles. Significant objects still have their place in the art world. It remains to be seen if they still have a place in land art. If the heyday of and the funding for huge art artworks is largely in the past, restoration projects still make sense. Here's a real and valuable function and work for artists who think big. I mean, Smithson would have loved to have gotten hold of this place. All over the West are unsightly gravel pits, slag heaps, mine shafts, overgrazed pastures, trampled riparian areas, piles of hazardous waste leaking into our drinking water systems, all begging for imaginative remediation. Artists, architects, and landscape architects working together have come up with some innovative notions about what to do with the world's accumulating brown fields from abandoned railroads, like the Santa Fe Rail Yard Park and Plaza, which I was very involved in for years, to immense factories in Germany and cemeteries in Spain. Bonnie Ott and Matthew Pottinger have proposed a postmodern conceptual artwork, earthwork architecture called the Temple of Mortalis, which, like Smithson's Ruins in Reverse, inverts the physical process by which architecture is made, revealing the temple not through construction, but through the natural processes of erosion and its byproduct talus. This is a part of that project, but I'm not quite sure. I've never seen it. A subdued level of romanticism makes ruins a mediation, and for some a meditation, between life and death, between the built and the natural environment, between architecture's sources and its inevitable resting place. The difference between the earthworks of 40 years ago and the more recent eco-art is not only the ecological consciousness gained in the intervening decades, it's also a new sense of the world beyond the site. Eco-art often invades natural and infrastructural systems to maintain or rehabilitate them. It has parallels in the new archaeology, which is more focused on the cultural landscape than on material culture and hauling stuff off to the show in museums. Without resorting to the quaint and the retrograde, contemporary artists and a lot of young collectives all over the world are demonstrating that they think that they can think micro as well as macro, local as well as global, the whole DIY movement. A more modest kind of land art, urban and rural, with its roots in conceptualism, from future farmers' hands-on Victory Gardens project in San Francisco to Mary Miss's prediction of floods due to global warming in Boulder, Colorado. That's the Mary Miss. I have to admit that my favorite art in the land is not contemporary. American Indian earthworks, geomorphs, and rock art, petroglyphs and pictographs, as petroglyphs here, are found by roadsides on golf courses and in the most remote deserts, forests, and canyons. Where contemporary land art demands all the attention like a spoiled child, rock art quietly absorbs us into its place, even when we understand very little about what the messages are, what messages we're getting. Although individual images stand out, 
They most compelling in relation to each other and to the place and clues they offer about the cultures that created them. Many of these sites are still utilized ceremonially. And of course, it's easier to identify with people who were once stewards of that particular landscape than with today's property owner, who's likely to appear with a rifle and arrest you for trespassing. This is by Deborah Ford. She works with uh, Western landforms and over old mining maps and, and mining documents and so forth. I've become increasingly involved in landscape photography because it works in the gap between art and life where I like to hang out. And because with plenty of exceptions, photography can seem less pretentious than the high art it aspires to. Though we no longer see photography as truth, it still conveys firsthand experience like no other medium. The context of documentary photography, the world of journalism rather than high art, has endowed it with a functional mission associated with infallibility in the public eye. Documentary photography has undergone a barrage of criticism over the last 20 years or so, as it's been redefined by any number of good photographers who insist on context, social narrative, and a seriality that facilitates a kind of narrative element. The battle between aesthetics and reportage in photography is an old one, but it has yet to be resolved. And this is a good thing, since it forces artists, critics, and environmentalists to carefully consider the images they offer and to what ends. Photography is the only art form that remains in a kind of aesthetic limbo, even as it dominates the contemporary art scene, as documentation, testimony, and aesthetic invention, even as it appears in museums in larger and larger scale, attracting more and more critical attention, perhaps precisely because it remains contested ground. This is by Robert Adams, Advancing Development in the Denver area. Landscape photography is a unique kind of documentation, routinely generalized, overwhelming place with image floating off into art land. Without the aid of captions, we have no idea what part of the world we're seeing, nor what the context is. So landscape photography is in an odd way even more dependent on verbal contextualization than other branches of documentary photography. It's preferred by the apolitical connoisseur because it appears to have no content even though some of the most gorgeous images have been used as propaganda to grease the wheels of manifest destiny or profit-based tourism, as well as environmental law. Therefore, all landscape photography can be said to be implicated in the failure to articulate the social importance of landscape and land use. At the same time, whoops. At the same time, it's also been used to save the wilderness, and it can be a unique way of communicating places and artworks to those who will never see them firsthand. Climate change is giving landscape photography a new mission. Some photographers, like Shabankar Banerjee in his Arctic work, this is polar bear footprints by him, who declare themselves activists first and artists second, aren't challenging the medium of photography so much as they're dealing with political land use issues. Individual style isn't their concern, and it can be difficult to tell their works apart. While specificity and local knowledge provide the base in the process of following the vortex of land and lives, the tantalizing liminal space is opened up between disciplines, between the arts, photography, geography, history, archaeology, sociology. Robert Adams, whose serial approach to landscape photography gave it a new social life, has said that we rely on landscape photography to make intelligible to us what we already know. He also said, what a landscape photographer traditionally tries to do is show what is past, present, and future at once. You want ghosts and the daily news and prophecy. It's presumptuous and ridiculous. You fail all the time. So, this is by John Gannis. It's a potash mine near Moab, Utah, right on the edge of it. Unfortunately, photographs of wounds on the land, vast strip mines, mountaintop removal, and colorfully toxic waters can be striking and even beautiful. Many environmentally concerned photographers have struggled with the beauty of ugliness. Many believe that beauty can powerfully convey difficult ideas by engaging people when they might otherwise look away. Others accuse photographers like Sebastião Salgado or Richard Misrak of aestheticizing disaster. Those who choose beauty for this subject matter are most effective when they're also aware of the flip side, when their choice of beauty is a conscious means to counter brutality. I like to think of a photograph as a field rather than an artifact, suggesting sequence layers and periphery, even when the number of images is limited. The Center for Land Use Interpretation, or CLUI, uh, 
based in Southern California, is a significant innovator in landscape photography as a unique blend of art and geography, disingenuously dedicated to the increase and diffusion of information about how the world's lands are appropriated, utilized, and perceived." End quote. It oversees a land use database, a peripatetic land use museum, and a site extrapolation division that conducts real and virtual tours of unusual and exemplary land use sites. All of this is as well as several residency sites around the country, including Wendover, Utah. No ego is involved. No artist's names are attached. The sly blandness with which Cluey's work is presented belies the hard information they offer about militarism, corporate destruction, deleted communities, and gravel pits. This is one of their gravel pit things. It also reminded me of the uh, process sculpture in the early 70s, late 60s. There were a lot of, a lot of artists who were working in piles then, and I noticed that I had a lot of piles in this talk. Oops. This is another Cluey photograph. In 2003, Cluey mounted an exhibition called Margins in Our Midst about gravel, the material that makes up the ground we live on, they called it. They conducted a tour, a bus tour, of the pits in the Los Angeles suburb of Irwindale, which is the largest aggregate mining area in the state, if not the nation, described as some of the most banal and dramatic landscapes in Los Angeles. By the time we're done, Cluey warned, we probably won't be able to tell the difference. Irwindale is so full of holes that more of the land in the city is a pit than not. It straddles a major alluvial fan, bringing marginal material from the mountains into the LA basin. That's useful and commercially viable, but the mountains are also the source of unpredictable avalanches, producing catastrophic debris flows that have destroyed parts of the city, necessitating the Santa Fe Dam, described by Cluey as, five, as a five-mile pile of rock built to hold back other piles of rock. Many of the pits are inactive, having been mined to the permitted depth of 200 feet. Some become dumps and landfills. One is a race car speedway. One was to be a stadium for the LA Raiders. Another is owned by the Catholic Archdiocese. Oops. So hidden evidence of the distant past often surfaces in gravel pits. Blackwater Draw in eastern New Mexico was the site of a major archaeological discovery in the 1920s when a Native American named James Ridgely Whiteman, who remains uncredited with this breakthrough, found the first Clovis Point arrowhead in association with mammoth bones, which brought the human record on the continent back to 13,000 years. This is not from Blackwater Draw. This is stuff I found on my own land when I was, it's a sheep shear because there was a lot of sheep industry there and a Pueblo shard. Anyway, White man uh, realized the significance of his find and alerted the Smithsonian, which blew him off. Eventually, archaeologists got the picture, because in the early 30s, the state of New Mexico began to dig gravel from the site and unearth masses of huge bones. This time, the archaeologists swarmed to the site, found hearths around its edge, and continuous remains from Paleo to Pueblo cultures. Blackwater Draw, once a watering hole for mammoths and their ilk, and also the site of the oldest well ever found in the New World, became history. And then later, it was history in another sense. The archaeologists were foiled in turn by the post-war highway boom, which demanded gravel. The site became one of the largest gravel mines in the state and was overrun with machines. The past was sacrificed to the present, and the spectacular evidence was reburied. What could be salvaged, which was little, is now on the National Register of Historic Places, and a small museum is open to the public. And this museum has been attacked by evangelical uh, creationists who don't believe 13,000 years means anything. The whole world was created 5,000 years ago. So how's that for a sequence of events that incorporates ironic, multicultural, multinational, local, global paradigms? As I work on, oh, this is by Will Wilson. He's Navajo. It's called Autoimmune Response, and it's, his, it's a whole series about his response to what's happening to the Navajo Nation in terms of coal and industry. As I work on local water and land issues, my mantra has become long-term thinking is in short supply. Western historian Patricia Limerick has pleaded for the ubiquitous ruins of the American West to be seen as evidences of failure rather than ignored in favor of rarer successes. Why not use the mining failures, the energy boom failures, the progress and development failures to our regional advantage? Failure is a prime opportunity to learn, she says. 
And then she asks us to question the assumptions that have driven Western economic behavior for years and our loyalty to high expectations that almost guarantee eventually eventual disappointment. In other words, let's look more carefully at the pits and disregard the erections for a while. This is, again, again from, by Peter Gowen uh, from that same Nuclear Landscape series. So gravel pits transform the geological past into dubious futures and are crucial to the production of modern spaces in the landscapes of western states. Gravel off offers a casual archaeology of the meeting places of nature and culture, past and present construction and destruction, art and life, creeping globalization and local survival. The emptiness of the pit suggests a similar alienation of land and culture, when nature is perceived as resource only. There's a point where artists have to take some responsibility for the places they love, a point at which the colonization of magnificent scenery gives way to a more painfully focused vision of a fragile landscape and its bewildered inhabitants. But dire warnings for the distant future don't go over real well in the US, even since 9-11. We Americans are immune to long-term thinking, very reluctant to give up our vaunted quality of life even as we watch it crumble before our very eyes as money goes to war and tax cuts for the rich instead of to social services and confronting the enormous cloud of climate change. It's not fear-mongering to say, get off the tracks, a train is coming. The US, with 5% of the population, uses 20% of the world's resources. Our way of life is endangering the whole world, and our government seems powerless to stand up to the powers that are taking us down. This is by Anton Dolezal. I think it's Oklahoma. So we're in a fog of confusion. Artists are good at slipping between the institutional walls to expose the layers of emotional and aesthetic resonance in our relationships to place, to the history of production buried in the land. The ultimate escape attempt is to free ourselves from the limitations of preconceived notions of art. Nature writer Rick Bass has suggested that the activist is the artist's ashes, emerging from the pure into the impure. I prefer to think of artists as phoenixes arising not from the ashes of their own aspirations, but from the ashes of an obsolete definition of art. And that's what's inspired these ramblings. Thanks. I'd like some questions of you. <laughs> you don't, it doesn't have to be, I guess I should. It doesn't have to be, is this, the, no, that's not the mic, that's the light. <laughs> um, this, you don't have to ask a question. I don't claim to have the answers to most questions, but uh, if you want to discuss something or make a brief statement, I, I'm not good at repeating what you say, so you have to talk loudly. Surely somebody has something. Yes, Terry, thank you. <laughs> land art or earth art as being a, a photography movement. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely what I've been saying, yeah. Say, could you comment a little bit on, on that? Yeah, I don't know if it's a photography movement as such, because I don't think most of the artists were, were they're very fussy about the photography of their stuff. I mean, Nancy's a good friend of mine. I haven't shown her this picture with the dog. <laughs> but um, but that, that's, I wanted to bring some life into that. But, uh, but I, you know, they really were working with Earth and so forth. So I don't think it was a photography movement as such, so much as photography is what made it work. I mean, none of this stuff, really, we would never have heard about any of this stuff without photography and without some money behind it, which helped them build stuff and so on. So, yeah, definitely. Big Muniz is a funny person. <laughs> yeah. I, I assume some of you heard him. I have a plate of his that somebody sent me some, at some point. With, with, um, it's, it looks like spaghetti has been eaten on it and left all over it, but it's Medusa with sort of snaky. <laughs> and people are horrified when they get served something off that plate. <laughs> <laughs> But I have high expectations of you. Um, but I, I'm curious about your feelings about um, you know Earth art coming in. I don't know. It's so complicated, isn't it? Because the intention of those artists was to show that um, art, that art could not be contained. 
the gallery, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you hear her back there? The intention of the artist was to show that art could not be contained as such. And that was that was conceptual art. And I mean, some people did this with a with a, a line, a Xerox lousy snapshot or a line of type, or you have the, the giant version of Larry Weiner here in the, in the, who used to do very modest little things and get, got bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> like the, but yeah, the contained, go ahead, I'm sorry. Desperately to, to not get into the structure of the art world of the gallery, mm -hmm. but in so doing, you're saying that they kind of came out and arrogantly placed something in a place that they had no connection to. Mm -hmm. And are you saying they actually really gave no thought to having? That? Well, I, I, I mean, I think every earth artist you talk to will say they have a huge connection to the people who are living around them. They, I mean, Jim Terrell has, has ranched in that, and the entire time he's been building that, has ranched in that area. I have a friend who used to be his ranch manager. So, I mean, he certainly does know that. I mean, you know, you can't. And, and Ross has been out there on that mesa in the summers for years and years and years. But it's not like anybody was ever asked, like, you know, what do you think about this? What is this community about? What is this land about? Does this have anything to do with it? That part of it, then they're, they're not into. And if they got into that, but but they, they they all love to say that everybody around there likes what they're doing, and it's not always true. But it's, I mean, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> we all like to. Think. Every public artist does that that I've ever known, uh, even at, at pieces that are really failures. They always say, "Oh, so and so came up, and they live in the neighborhood, and they just loved it," and it may well be true. So. But I do think that, that, I mean, I'm not so much trying, I use earth art to say some stuff I want to say, obviously, and, and it just happened, this section seemed to make more sense for a talk. But, uh, I, you know, I, I was very excited by what they were doing then, and because it was a real innovation, and it, it looked, I mean, but I didn't live in the West then. And once I lived out here, I began to see it very differently. And, and you know, I was, I, it was for city people, I really do think that. And it works for city people because we, we like, I mean, it's like tourism and so forth. It also got New York's mind out of New York, like that there was something beyond. Yeah, and New York is one of the most provincial places in the world, I mean, <laughs> which nobody in New York would, likes to really confront. But when I got involved with community arts years and years ago, 30 years ago or so, I discovered that there was this wonderful theater thing in Omaha, and there were wonderful things here and there and all over the place that I had never heard of because I was a provincial New Yorker. <laughs> and that, that I got a lesson from that. Somebody back here. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it just I want to just comment that practically everything you said sounded like it could be turned into a whole volume by itself. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> This is maybe ridiculous to drag in yet one more thing, but I'm curious, uh, especially because of what you said about photography, as to whether you're thinking about land art and related issues, it, how, how have you thought about how those, that inquiry extends into virtual space? Yes, I always get this question, <laughs> and I am a Luddite. I live off the grid. I don't have television. I, I finally got an email two years ago, and it's ruined my life. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm really the last person who should talk about that. But it's a fascinating issue, and I, I wish I could talk about it more sensibly. But I don't like seeing things on a screen. I am, a, I am uh, obsessed with being out on the land and walking on it and seeing what how it crunches under the feet or doesn't or whatever. Um, and I can't get any of that from, but I'm sure there, I went to a lecture actually last night in Santa Fe by a young artist named Terry Rube. I don't know if any of you, R-U-E-B. She teaches at the University of Buffalo. She has a PhD from Harvard Graduate School of Design. I mean, she, and she does these soundscapes, which she uses GPS technology. And she's been doing this for 15 years. And 15 years ago, GPS technology was something that was not on everybody's dashboard and so forth. So, so it's a, and I'm not quite clear why GPS is so important to some of this stuff, but it's, you wear headphones. 
And she says some people really hate headphones, and I would hate walking around with headphones. But she says that they, they produce an interesting space, which is your head, I guess. <laughs> and and um, but they're they're quite fascinating. She works. She does an extraordinary amount of research. She talks to the community, and so part of what you hear is voices from the people who live in the place. And she's working right now with a Navajo woman who's older and who is an archaeologist, which is also a little odd for Navajo who do not like dead things. And, um, and so she's kind of gone across uh, against the grain herself in a way that Terry's going against the grain of some other stuff. But she also, Terry also has a, she did a, something at the ICA in Boston with a, a sculptural component. She did a whole soundscape thing on Spectacle Island, which was a Native American site, then it was something else and something else and something else and, and then it was a dump and then it was transformed into a park. So it's had a, layers and layers of history and she uses that. But you can stand at the ICA in Boston, which is right on the harbor, and look at this, I'm going like this because it's a very long tube, a metal tube, which you hitch up to and you listen to the sounds if you aren't out on the island and so forth. So it's all, it all seems a little abstracted to me because I've, I've gone really from years of being interested in abstraction in one sense or another to, to wanting uh, a certain kind of substance in the lived experience. But that doesn't mean everybody has to be into that. I mean, people are always yelling at me that I don't like art anymore or something. I just say, no, this is what interests me. Artists are allowed to work on whatever they're interested in. I don't know why I shouldn't be allowed to work on what I'm interested in. So, so this, is, this is what, yeah. Oh, um, I have a question about your last statement, um, artists rising from the ashes of obsolete art. You, and you mentioned um, the, the urban areas becoming, I guess, polluted with visual competition. I'm not really saying they're polluted. I think they're energized with, you know, yeah, I, mean, I shouldn't have said. Uh, are you concerned at all with um, the increasing number of artists coming out of MFA programs and becoming artists and activists? Um, I guess, crowding um, the earth with... Uh... No, because I think a lot of young artists and activists and a lot of the DIY movement and so forth are stepping very lightly on the earth. They're really, I mean, that's why I contrast them to this, and I, that would be another whole lecture, obviously. I started to get more of that in as long enough as it was. But um, but I think that there is there is a difference between people who are going to a place, studying a place, and really... And this can happen in the city. And I, mean, I worked in you know the streets in the city for years and loved it. But the city is a different. I mean, Santa Fe, where it's my shopping city now, is not the kind of place where you can really do that. It's funny. I mean, I've put up posters, wheat pasted things, and so forth, and they get torn down in a second. I mean, you know, that it's not that kind of context for whatever reason. And, and certainly, my village isn't. I mean, every now and then, I think, well, what would I? I, I started writing this thing about what is the place for land art in the New West. And um, my, yeah, on there, I guess that would work. Uh, and I began to realize that there was no place in my landscape, which you saw a picture, that was my birdhouse, um, that I wanted to see anybody screwing around with stuff. I, th I think we could use a community garden, and artist community gardens tend to be much more interesting than anybody else's community gardens, because there's always some kind of provocative uh, way that people are doing things. I don't show pictures of that much because they all look like community gardens, but there's often quite a lot of layering and interesting stuff. Marguerite Carl and Marietta Potrick did something in Venice, Italy recently about the water. I mean, talk about water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. I mean, there's a whole weird water situation there. But anyway, the, the, so I, I, I see cities as a wonderful place to work too, but this, that's not where I live now, so that's not what I'm thinking about much. But, but, the, but being out in the, in the land itself, it is, I mean, I, one piece that I did like that somebody in Santa Fe did, a guy named Zane Fisher, um, he went into a, an arroyo and placed pretty high where they wouldn't be flooded most of the time until a flash flood, a, b a bunch of old books, and they were just sort of, I think the pages part was out rather than the spines, I can't quite remember. But And these books just stayed there until they finally went away. And it was kind of wonderful to walk by them and see all that language and that object beginning to disintegrate. And, and it wasn't, I, I don't think of it as polluting the world. It probably is on some level. Everything seems to be. But I, I quite like that piece. But what I think about what I like to see about Smith and Nancy Holt lives in this village that I live in. And uh, I've known her forever. And and she's never done anything around there. 
and has I, I don't think has much interest in in doing anything there. So it's it's sort of interesting if you start if you really start thinking about context, which is what's always interested me about art. Is okay. Why is this being placed in this place and so on? And that goes for the most abstract and non-community kind of work and and uh, like some of Richard Serra's things. Oh, this is a gorgeous Serra out here. Um, anyway, I'm just kind of rambling on. Does that get you anywhere? <laughs>